Hello students, welcome to this video session of Ask Expert pertaining to the doubts and their clarification. This is Sekar from M Sigma Gokulam. I am one of the senior most teachers in mechanical engineering having an experience of more than 25 years uh, teaching experience uh, in GATE, IES and various uh, government competitive examinations across India. In fact, uh, I had a huge experience of the, uh, in the teaching experience of mechanical engineering for various competitive examinations. In fact, in throughout all my years of experience, I have observed one thing that students keep asking the doubts, students keep chasing the teachers many times, even immediately after the our covers of the lectures. Uh, those, those days there were no facilities like, uh, uh, um, in fact, uh, YouTube or any no online facilities. People used to wait outside the classrooms to get their doubts clarified. In fact, as you keep preparing for the examinations, maybe IES or a GATE or even a semester examinations or maybe even a government uh, sector examinations like ISRO, BARC, BARC, uh, DRDO or maybe a central exam central government examinations or a state government examinations. As the students keep preparing for various competitive examinations which are being conducted across India or maybe at the state level, people get the students keep getting the doubts. So keep getting the, I mean getting the doubts is one of the most important positive signs that you are understanding something about the subject. If you don't get the doubts, they, there are two possibilities. You have understood the whole subject, everything thoroughly, like as we teachers uh, are, uh, um, I mean, do, or you don't know anything. So that means if you are getting the doubt, means you are, you are uh, proceeding in a positive direction of the preparation. So many students uh, keep telling me that the moment they get the doubts, if they are not getting clarified, if they are those doubts are not getting clarified, they feel that they get stuck they get stuck in the preparation and they would not be able to proceed further because unless and until the doubts get cleared, they don't feel like uh, proceeding further in the preparation. That is the usual uh, usual um, psychology of the students because um, even, even we felt we're during our uh, college days also in the same way. So, uh, ha having, up to, having, get, having getting the doubts and getting them clarified as immediately as possible is the most important uh, I mean, uh, privilege that students must get while preparing for the uh, while preparing for any competitive examinations. In fact, uh, in that context, keeping all these points in mind, in M Sigma Gogolam, we are launching one group. In fact, we already there is a one group. We already there is one group, Mechanical Engineering Student Community Group. Uh, in there. In fact, uh, there is an ask, ask expert, there is an ask expert program where all the students of the mechanical engineering, irrespective of the examination they are going to prepare, maybe a semester examination, maybe a gate examination, maybe IES, maybe a public sector examination, whatever may be the kind of examination they are rating. Those mechanical engineering in the students, they can freely log into that particular uh, ask expert uh, I mean uh, mechanical engineering community and immediately post your doubts there and you will get the clarification within hours. Within hours because uh, we have a team of experts here, uh, uh, ex most experienced in the respective fields and they would be able to uh, answer your queries immediately the moment you rise, you post your question uh, in that uh, group. That answering may be orally or maybe through the voice message. Sometimes voice message, sometimes orally or giving the solution to the problem what you are raising. In fact, one, one thing, some examples I would like to tell. So in the, for the last uh, seven or eight months, because I am clearing the, some of the doubts, one of the, some of the most prominent doubts which I keep would like to highlight here. Say for example, heat transfer. Taking the heat transfer subject, many students keep asking me, sir, you keep telling about black body radiation. What is the meaning by black body? Does it look black in color? Does it look black in color when you see that? It does the black body necessarily look uh, black in color when for the human eye? Need not be. So I keep telling that. I keep clearing the doubts like this. A thermally black body which is absorbing all the thermal radiation falling upon that. A thermally black body which is absorbing all the thermal radiation falling upon that may not appear black in color when you see that uh, black body. For example, it's ice. Ice is thermally black, but it won't appear black when you see that. But in fact, in the thermal radiation analysis of heat transfer, we always consider the sun as a thermally black body. Do the sun appear black? So, thermal blackness and visible blackness are entirely different. Why so? Again, they keep asking, students keep asking, why so? Why thermally blackness may be different to the visible blackness? The reason is, in the thermal radiation, your uh, 
thermal radiation bandwidth of electromagnetic wave propagation is 0 0.1 to 100. This is the thermal radiation, uh, thermal radiation bandwidth on the electromagnetic spectrum. This is on the electromagnetic spectrum, 0 0.1 to 100 microns in the thermal radiation bandwidth. But whereas the visible light, visible light is very narrow, 0 0.35 to the 0.7, this is the visible light. So, a thermal light black body may be a very good absorber for all these radiations and they may, they, it may reflect the little radiation in this band, in this, band, in this particular wavelength range. That is why a thermal light black body which is very good absorber for all the infrared thermal radiation may be reflecting little radiation in the visible range. That is why it may not be appearing the uh, black in color. So that is how we substantiate uh, the, what is the thermal blackness and what, what is the visible black. What is a visible black body? A visible black body will completely absorb all the radiations in that visible light range that is 0.35 microns to the 0.7 microns. So that is one of the most commonly asked doubt in the thermal radiation. For example, uh, coming to the effectiveness uh, of the heat exchanger, but that is a very commonly asked question I keep uh, uh, getting asked in that uh, in the in defining the effectiveness of the heat exchanger, Q actual divided by Q maximum possible, Q maximum possible heat transfer rate. And while calculating this Q maximum possible heat transfer rate, we always consider m dot Cp small into Thi minus Tca, where Thi minus Tca are the temperatures of the hot and cold fluids at the inlet of the heat exchanger, I for the inlet. Then why then, uh, why people keep asking why, why you have considered this small, why not big, why not big, because m dot Cp is called as a capacity rate, there are two capacity rates for the one for the hot fluid and other for the cold fluid, why did you consider the m dot Cp small, why not the bigger, while well, calculating the maximum possible heat transfer rate for defining the effectiveness of the heat exchanger, this is the reason, this is a very most commonly asked uh, doubt I keep uh, getting uh, while covering the heat transfer subject. Why I rate m dot Cp small is, I could give three different reasons for that, but the main, the main uh, uh, sounding or the main important reason will be energy balance equation. In the, we have an energy balance equation that could be written in every heat exchanger. The rate of enthalpy decrease of the hot side fluid is equal to the rate of enthalpy increase of the cold side fluid. That is, and from the energy balance equation, m dot H Cph Thi minus Tci is equal to m dot C Cpc Tce minus Tci. Supposing if you write the, if you write for calculating the maximum possible heat transfer rate, if you write m dot Cp big instead of small, if you write big, the, the if, if you write the small, if you write the big instead of the small, the other side fluid which is having the, which is having the smaller capacity rate must have a temperature change more than this. If you write this m dot Cp big here, from the energy balance equation, that side fluid having a smaller capacity rate must have a temperature change more than Thi minus Tci, which will simply violate the second law of thermodynamics. Because in any heat exchanger, no fluid can have a temperature change more than this Thi minus Tci, because this is the maximum temperature difference existing. This is the maximum temperature difference existing between hot and cold fluids. So I have to write only m dot Cp small. If I write, I repeat the once again the reasoning there. If I write m dot Cp big here, the other side fluid which is having a smaller capacity rate because there are two fluids. One is smaller capacity rate, other is bigger capacity rate. If I write the bigger capacity rate here for calculating the maximum possible heat transfer rate, then the other side fluid which has got the smaller capacity rate should undergo a temperature change more than this, which is not possible according to the second law of thermodynamics. So that is why I have to write the m dot Cp small. I can give other reason also. When the steam is condensing, when the steam is condensing in a condenser, the steam condensing has got an infinite heat capacity rate, whereas the cooling water has got a finite capacity rate. If I want me to write the m dot Cp big here, don't write small. If you want me to demand to write the m dot Cp big, I have to write the m dot Cp of the steam, which is of infinite value. How can I write the uh, infinite here? So it's saying that maximum possible heat transfer is infinity. It cannot be infinity. 
So I have to write only cooling water side capacity rate, which is a smaller value. In the I am talking about the steam condenser. Like this, I can give many reasons why I am rating the smaller capacity rate for calculating the maximum possible heat transfer rate. That is a very simple uh, doubt people often, students uh, preparing for the many competitive examinations in mechanical engineering often getting that doubt. For example, if you can give the other example, like in, ca in case of a convection, you say that you say that uh, as the as the laminar flow and turbulent flow is happening over a flat plate that uh, that uh, that in fact the laminar flow convection heat transfer coefficient keeps decreasing and uh, suddenly it will shoot up in the transition period again it keeps decreasing this is a laminar region this is the turbulent region this is the transition between the laminar to the turbulent so then people asking me, students keep asking me why first of all it is decreasing, why it is suddenly rising in the transition and why it is again, why it is again decreasing in the turbulent region and in the laminar region and the turbulent region, it is uh, uh, as x is increasing, this is the y direction, this is x direction, as x in keeps increasing from the leading edge to the trailing edge, the local convection heat transfer coefficient keeps on decreasing and in the transition suddenly it rises there, this is the transition where the uh, uh, local convection heat transfer co coefficient suddenly jumps and again it keeps decreasing in the turbulent flow. Why it is happening like this is, the main reason is this is the direction of the heat transfer in the laminar region or in the turbulent region. This is the, this is the free stream temperature, this is an isothermal plate having a TW temperature. So as X is increasing, as X is increasing the distance from the leading edge keeps increasing the boundary layer thickness keeps increasing. See this, the thermal boundary layer thickness keeps increasing or of course the hydrodynamic boundary layer thick set, thickness keeps increasing. The thicker boundary layers, the thicker boundary layers will be offering more thermal resistance against the heat flow. That is why Hx value keeps decreasing in the laminar flow and also in the here also. See this, here also the boundary layer thickness is increasing that therefore Hx keeps decreasing. But why it is jumping in the transition region? Because Definitely, definitely in the turbulent flow is associated with continuous intermingling of the fluid particles. Whereas, the, whereas in the laminar flow, the fluid particles just uh, traveling, traveling uh, in streamlines like uh, one layer of the smoothly, one layer of the fluid smoothly, smoothly sliding over its adjacent layer. There is no intermingling of the fluid particles. If there is a continuous intermingling is prevailing in the turbulent flow, that can rapidly take away the heat from the from the plate, therefore the Hx values in the turbulent region are clearly far higher than in the laminar region. The Hx values in the turbulent region definitely must be and should be more than the Hx values in the laminar region because this intermingling among the fluid particles, that intermixing or the intermingling of the fluid particles among the fluid layers can rapidly sweep away the heat from the plate, thereby the local convection heat transfer coefficient values are much more in the turbulent region than in the laminar region. But in the turbulent flow also that Hx keeps, Hx keeps decreasing. This is a turbulent flow. Here also Hx keeps decreasing. Why? Again the boundary layer thickness is increasing. So if, uh, if the students get a doubt that why the Hx is decreasing, physically how do you explain means? Because the boundary layer thickness, the thermal boundary layer thickness keeps increasing as we go from the leading edge to the trailing edge both in laminar flow and also in the turbulent flow. That is the reason why this Hx is decreasing. That is one of the important commonly asked doubts are because as I keep uh, uh, looking into the that community uh, doubts uh, group, these are the questions I often uh, keep observing asked by the students, many students like uh, Mr. Jibin and uh, Mr. Vundikrishnan and they have those people who keep asking the questions uh, very often in that uh, uh, community, mechanical engineering community, student community. And for example, if you just ask the, uh, for example, the, regarding the, in the conduction chapter, the most commonly asked question is, what is this Boyet number and what is its significance? What is this H, yes there? What is the yes there, characteristic dimension? And, uh, and what is the link between Boyet number and the Nusselt number? Because Nusselt number is another number you see in the, uh, both look at the, uh, the formula is same. Both look at the same formula, look at the formula for the Boyet number and Nusselt number. But here it is the conductivity of the fluid. Even though both Boyet number and Nusselt number look alike, the formula wise, the denominators are different. Here it is the thermal conductivity of the solid, here it is the thermal conductivity of the fluid. This S is called as the characteristic dimension which is given by volume by 
volume of the body divided by surface area of the body. In fact, uh, the, the, this is a one uh, important uh, doubt generally uh, I keep facing. So, do the Bayot number and Nusselt number uh, are the same? No. Though formula is same, denominators are different. Conductivity of the solid and conductivity of the fluid. And as far as this Bayot number is concerned, this is the criteria for uh, as long as it is a Bayot number is less than 0.1, we can apply the lumped heat capacity analysis. Lumped heat analysis, Bayot number is the criteria in unsteady state heat conduction. Bayot number is the criteria whether lumped heat analysis and anal lumped heat capacity analysis is valid or not. If the Bayot number is less than 0.1, this is a this is a domain. If the Bayot number is less than 0.1, lumped heat capacity analysis is valid. That means internal temperature gradients within the body can be neglected. We can think that the temperature of the body is uniform throughout its mass at any instant of time. That is a very commonly asked question I see in the uh, conduction chapter. And of course, this uh, Nusselt number will, will always be greater than 1. That much one, the one thing you can say. Nusselt number would always be greater than 1. It is also called as the dimensionless temperature gradient. Nusselt number is also called as the dimensionless temperature gradient. Some books call it as the dimensionless heat transfer coefficients, but more or more commonly should be called as the dimensionless temperature gradient dimensionless temperature gradient. In fact, uh, uh, this once you get the Nusselt number in the convection chapter, your job is done. Your job is done, you have got the, once you get, calculate the Nusselt number in the convection, your H is done, H is calculated. So, that is the significance of the Nusselt number and uh, uh, Nusselt number will be there in forced convection and as well as in the free convection. And of course, free in the only difference between forced and free convection you see. Where actually, many people ask me, how do you say that which is a convection is prevailing, whether a forced or a free? How do you decide? When you are doing the convection problem, the students keep asking, how do you know it is a forced convection or a free convection? Very simple justification that if you see the any velocity or the mass flow rate in the problem, it is a forced convection. If you do not see any velocity or the mass flow rate or the flow rate or the flow of the fluid, it is a free convection. If in the free convection, we always calculate the Grashof number. There is no velocity there. In the forced convection, first step will be to calculate the Reynolds number and decide whether the flow is laminar or turbulent. So, the, rain, the significance of the Reynolds number you may observe in two different subjects, fluid mechanics and also in the heat transfer. See, that Reynolds number is again there in the incompressible flow through pipes of the fluid mechanics and also in the boundary layer theory of the fluid mechanics. But same Reynolds number is again appears in the in the forced convection heat transfer. Whether it is an external flow in heat transfer or internal flow through the pipes, very first step in the forced convection heat transfer problem is to calculate the Reynolds number and then decide whether the flow is laminar or turbulent. If the flow is laminar, you will select a different formula for the Nusselt number because Nusselt number is a function of Reynolds number and Prandtl number in forced convection. Whereas, Nusselt number is a function of Grashof number and Prandtl number in the free convection. So, you will see the Reynolds number in the forced convection. In, in lieu of the Reynolds number, you see the Grashof number in the free convection. So, this kind of a distinguishing. Generally, students keep asking, how do you proceed? How do you form the algorithm? The problem solving algorithm of convection because convection is a, one of the people feel that is the toughest chapter they keep preparing uh, in the for the exams because they take the cho choice because other chapters they will prepare and try to answer and try to pass out the examination particularly when they are doing the semester exams. But convection if you prepare thoroughly if you mean if you understand thoroughly the fluid mechanics convection is the easiest chapter of the heat transfer subject because there is some certain algorithm. First decide whether the flow is laminar or forced or free, then calculate the characteristic dimension, then calculate the Reynolds number, decide the flow and just pick up the formula for the Nusselt number, Nusselt number versus Reynolds number versus Prandtl number. Whether it is an internal flow, one formula, whether it is an external flow, this is an external flow, this is an external flow and uh, sometimes the flow may be internal, the flow may be internal, flow through the pipe or flow through a duct. Then the formula for the Nusselt number, Reynolds number, Prandtl number will be different. So, that, that is how this, uh, I keep getting this, see, as you keep preparing for the subject, as you keep preparing for the examinations, the very often, very often, very frequently students, students keep getting the doubts because unfortunately they are not properly guided. Maybe their, uh, their teachers are in the college or somewhere else. If they do not get a proper guidance, the, the way they should prepare also they miss. 
the direction. When they are preparing, very quite natural that they keep getting the doubts. If the doubt is not clear, cleared immediately by an, by an appropriate expert, subject expert, generally most of the students will think that, okay, let me ask my classmate, let me ask my senior. They are not competent to clear those doubts. If they are really competent, why should they will be somewhere else? They will not be sitting along with you. They will be somewhere else. So, they will not be competent. So, you have to ask only the expert which is thoroughly experienced in that uh, subject. If you ask any ordinary teacher also, again you will miss that. Uh, uh, he may, give, he may uh, guide you in a wrong direction. Getting the doubt is one thing and getting the doubt cleared by an expert, proper expert, expert of this uh, respective subject is much more important because if you choose a wrong person to get the doubt cleared, you will be directed in a wrong direction and finally end up in the nothing. Okay, so you will be wasting your time. So you have to ask the appropriate person who is a, having a thorough knowledge pertaining to that particular subject where you are getting the doubts. For example, if you just ask the uh, thermodynamics. In the thermodynamics, uh, the very uh, most common question what I get is, what is this integral PDV and what is integral VDP? What are these as such? Because you got two different integrals. Uh, one is VDP and other is PDV. When do you write this? When do you write this? See, this will be written for the closed system and this one we write for the open system. Both the pro both the equations are hold good only for the reversible, reversible process only. Both are valid only for the reversible process. Incidentally, this is the area of the PV curve on y axis. This is the area of the PV curve on x axis. So, this is for you write for the closed, this you refer to because you will be deciding uh, the before attempting any thermodynamic problem you will be first answering the three queries, three queries. What is the nature of the system? What is the nature of the working fluid? What is the nature of the process? Whether it is reversible or irreversible, whether it is a closed or a open, what is the working fluid there? Ideal gas or a perfect gas or a real gas? What is a, whether it is a steam or a refrigerant? So you, you will kind of queries you will be asking and then appropriately picking up the formula. So this is the, this is the one, this is the one which we uh, use it. This is the one we use it for the compressor, pump and turbine. We use it for the compressor, pump and turbine. For all the things you can write. If, and this is the one which you use it for a, for any gases expanding in a piston cylinder arrangement like a, you know. So this is the one which you write for the integral PDV here. You will be writing integral VDP for these three devices, compressor or a pump or a turbine. So this kind of a distinguishing. Uh, we should be able to do but and the students obviously get okay what should we write because both indicate the work integral pdv indicate the work integral vdp indicate the work but which formula i have to select that is based upon the what system you are dealing whether it is a closed or whether it is a open and for example uh, generally when you are putting that uh, when you are putting that air standard cycles the most important air standard cycles what we get is the pv on the PV diagram, this is an auto, this is diesel, say. This is an auto and diesel, a standard, uh, air standard cycles which are used for the IC engines, right? These are the air standard cycles. And uh, most of the things uh, will think that auto cycle is thermally more efficient than diesel. But under what condition? Because there are two different conditions will arise here. Which is thermally more efficient, how do you decide? Based upon what is maintained same between the two cycles. For the same R, for same compression ratio, for the same compression ratio or auto is greater than diesel, no doubt. But, but for same peak pressure and temperature, same peak pressure and temperature, peak pressure and temperature and for same heat supplied and for same QS heat supplied, this reverse is true. Diesel is more efficient than auto. Diesel is thermally more efficient than auto. When you look at the, for the same peak pressure and temperature and for the same heat supply, that is for different compression ratios. Because we don't apply the compression ratios. Here the compression ratios is around 6 to 9. If you take, here the compression ratios is 16 to 22. This is for the CI, this is for the SI. So, diesel engines employ far greater compression ratios as compared to the as compared to the SI engines. Therefore, the comparison based upon the same compression ratio is useless. Practically speaking, it is useless. Useless comparison. Practically speaking, for the same ROV should not compare because we don't apply the same compression ratio in petrol engines and diesel engines. We apply 22 here, we will apply maximum of around 7 or 8. 
So like this comparison is practically useless comparison. This is more practically, uh, practically employable, practically uh, usable uh, comparison. So that is the reason why it's practically also CA engines are thermally more efficient than the SA engines. Why the diesel engines are thermally more efficient than the petrol engines? Because diesel engines employ far greater compression ratios as compared to the petrol engine. So that is the such kind of questions are very commonly uh, posted in the regarding the thermodynamics. Even the same is true. Same is true with the uh, Breton cycle actually. You see, you have the three different uh, power plants like IC, GT and steam. IC, G GT and steam. Each one has got the highest uh, peak temperature among the, if you just look at the three power plants, each, each power plant has got the highest temperatures fixed according to the practical because in the steam you will maximum you can use 600 degrees Celsius, maximum you may use here 1200 degrees Celsius, you may go up to 2000 degrees Celsius in the IC engines practically speaking. Then why it is limited to 600, why it is going up to the 2000 here, why it is up to 1200. Generally people asking that why the temperatures are limited there only, why can't, why can't we use this 2000 here, why don't we use 600 here. The reason is unlike gas turbines and steam turbines, unlike gas turbines and IC engines, steam turbines never, you can never think of the cooling, you can never think of the cooling. Because if you, if you cool the steam turbine, steam will condense, when the steam will condense, the moisture will form. Those moisture particles may cause the erosion of the turbine blades. The moisture content during the expansion of the steam in the steam turbine cannot be less than the 90 percent. The lowest dryness fraction values permitted are should always be greater than 0.9 x is the dryness fraction. So the dryness fraction if it is less than 90 percent, there will be an erosion of the turbine blades. So we, I can't uh, dare, I can't dare to have the moisture content more than 10 percent or dryness fraction values less than the 90 percent. Lowest dryness fraction, lowest quality of the steam during the expansion of the steam in the steam turbine, the lowest quality is around 0.9. If, you, if there is around 0 0.8 at 0 0.75, there is a severe damage to the turbine blades because of the problem of erosion, erosion of the turbine blades. So, you can't think, you can't, you cannot think of cooling the steam turbine blades. When you cannot cool, how can you provide the highest uh, temperatures for the steam? Because steam turbine blades will simply twist off. They will be subjected to the severe thermal stresses. So, I can't think of these. So, so, and then IC engine is thoroughly cooled. Contrary to that, we have the thoroughly cooled, we have the cooling water jackets, we have the special coolants used in the SA engines and CA engines. We can increase the temperature of the working fluid like anything. Uh, so, there is no problem of, uh, there is no problem of material withstanding. The currently used materials used in the steam turbine blades, because they cannot be cooled, they cannot sustain more than 600 degrees Celsius. Here you are providing very good cooling around the engine cylinders. Therefore, I can think of rising the working fluid temperature up to 2000 even beyond that also. The high powered CA engines, high powered CA engines, diesel engines, they, have, they may have the, the peak temperatures at the end of the combustion may be well above the 2500 degrees Celsius also. And uh, these gas turbine blades are partially cooled. Gas turbine blades are partially cooled by using the air, compressed air. This is a gas turbine blades. You make the blades hollow, we may cool it and temperatures can be up to 1100 or 1200 because why I am specific about these temperatures is these temperatures will indirectly influence the thermal efficiency of the plant. If, if I can increase to from 600 to 700 to 800, definitely the thermal efficiency of that rank and cycle will be definitely more. Because on what power plant, on what cycle the steam power plant runs, rank and cycle. If I increase the peak temperatures of the steam well above the 700 or 800 by using some, by finding some metallurgical uh, uh, limit of the blades. I have found out a steam turbine blade material which can withstand above 800 degrees Celsius, say for example. Definitely the thermal efficiency of that rank and cycle will be much more. Because higher the temperatures, higher the temperatures what you see in the rank and cycle, higher the temperatures you see in the rank and cycle instead of 600 if you go to 700 if you go to 800 higher the temperatures of the steam uh, employed in the rank and cycle this is the boiler pressure and this is the condenser pressure so if you provide if you increase this temperature the thermal efficiency of the cycle also will be more in the rank and cycle so this kind of a we, we should link the dots we should link the dots. We, there are many dots while you are preparing the for the subject. Getting the dots means you are you have an empty dot in your brain. 
we got some other doubt there somewhere and how you have to link up those dots and with a proper explanation from an expert there comes the there comes the guidance of an expert the subject expert like us we know how to how to join those dots of in any subject see each subject is not unique if you just look at the, the if you know thoroughly the thermodynamics you will be thoroughly knowing the power plant if you know thoroughly the fluid mechanics you will be thoroughly knowing the heat transfer because all are interlinked you know subject is unique in its own because every subject is connected to the other in some way or other unless uh, you are thorough with the fundamental very fundamental concepts of the thermodynamics then you would not be able to uh, understand properly the power plant subject and again you have unless otherwise you have a thorough knowledge of the pure substances you would not be able to understand the refrigeration chapter generally i see in the r and ac refrigeration cycle if you just look at the refrigeration cycle very often i i get this doubt that I, I keep uh, uh, I keep uh, posted from the doubts from the students. I'm talking about the the doubts asked by students. This is a VCR cycle, vapor compression refrigeration cycle. This is a throttle valve. So why are you keeping this throttle valve? Why don't you Why don't you think of planning an expander there? Why don't you think of planning an expander instead of a throttle valve? Instead of a throttle valve or expansion valve, why don't you plan an expander to decrease the pressure from condenser to the evaporator pressure pressure of the refrigerant and get extract some work there and supply that work for the compressor so the reason is yes no doubt if you replace the throttle valve by an expander here by an expander here definitely you will get some work definitely the cop can be improved much a little bit but the work what you are getting during the expander is very 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 little because here the liquid is expanding the very little work you get and uh, that expander is not worth keeping the problem theoretically it looks nice that you get some expander work and that will improve the cop etc but practically speaking that expander is not worth keeping because, because that will increase the initial cost and the extra component extra maintenance etc so uh, they always replace with a throttle valve throttle valve is a simple capillary tube which is uh, decreasing the pressure of the refrigerant from condenser pressure to the evaporator pressure due to the friction due to the friction against the flow of the refrigerant the capillary tube is a, a simple lengthy tube as the refrigerant is a liquid is passing due to the frictional resistance and the pressure will decrease this is a simple very simple or easily replaceable cheapest device called as the capillary tube which is used commonly in the uh, domestic refrigerators and the window air conditioners nowadays most of the domestic refrigerators use this expansion device so the commonly asked question is if you replace this throttle valve with expander what would happen to the cop no doubt cop will, will increase but that is not worth keeping practically keeping the difficulties of maintenance into account so like that like that the questions may be asked uh, the doubts keep I, I keep getting the doubts like that for example if you just ask the if we just look at the air conditioning uh, situation if we, and the air conditioning or the psychrometry there so the in fact in many in many relations of the psychrometry relative humidity phi is equal to pv by ps what is this both are the partial pressures of the water vapor what is this pv and what is this ps both are the partial pressures but this pv is the partial pressure of the water vapor under unsaturated condition this is the partial pressure of the water vapor under saturated condition both are calculated at the same temperature rh5 rh5 relative humidity phi is the pv under unsaturated condition what is that pv partial pressure of water vapor under unsaturated condition ps is the partial pressure of the water vapor under saturated condition so that ratio will give the rh both are the partial pressures of the water vapor only if you just look at the steam table most of the things they will be given in the steam tables data this is the uh, saturation pressure versus saturation temperature corresponding to the dry bulb temperature what is the saturation pressure is ps and corresponding to the pv what is the saturation temperature is dpt dew point temperature dpt is the temperature where the condensation of the water vapor starts when the condensation of the water vapor starts when the mixture of dry air and water vapor is cooled at constant pressure and corresponding to that what is the saturation pressure that is pv in fact these two values all these values are given in the table in the problem and which one to be picked up 
So, the baby, so if you understand this table, you are able to immediately calculate RH. Once you calculate RH, you can get the specific humidity also because these are the most commonly asked uh, uh, data in the air conditioning or the psychrometry problems. This is a total barometric pressure, total outside atmospheric pressure. You may take it this as the 100 kilopascal if nothing is mentioned or 101 or one, some, sometimes you take uh, 101 kilopascal. If nothing is mentioned, if it is mentioned, whatever the given value you take. So, See, as the as you keep preparing for the that doubts will come only when you start preparing, when you start getting in more and more penetrating into the subject. So one doubt clarification clarified automatically automatically helps you many more doubts getting clarified by yourselves. Supposing an expert, a subject expert clarified your doubt at one particular corner of the preparation of the subject. Automatically all other uh, doubts that gets followed there beyond that. Automatically everything, one doubt getting clarified, man, man can clarify many other doubts which you are following uh, during the preparation of the subject. So that is, uh, that is why getting the doubts clarified by, from the proper expert of the subject is very essential during any preparation. So for example, if you just look at the uh, Stantha materials there, the most common important uh, topic it will be theories of failure. The most important topic is the, is the theories of failure. You have the five theories of failure. Rankine theory or principal, uh, principal stress theory, maximum principal stress theory, maximum principal strength theory, distortion energy theory, etc. So, Rankine theory or von Mises theory, etc. So, and which theory is applicable to what material and when it is applied? Practically, theories of failure is the most important topic in the Shantam materials where you will be, uh, will be applying in the machine design concepts, you will be applying in the, uh, you will be applying in the uh, material, uh, material strength concepts. So, what theory should be applied where? So, Van Mises theory is there. Under what? That is a distortion energy theory. When, for what kind of material it can be applied? Under what, under what context? Because, because distortion energy theory is more applicable, more suitable for the design of the shafts where shaft is subjected to a pure shear. A shaft transmitting power is subjected to a pure shear. For that particular uh, uh, condition that von Mises theory or distortion energy theory is applicable. Uh, uh, under for, for what kind of material? Mostly it is a ductor material. For example, if you look at the maximum principal stress theory or Rankine theory, it is applicable for the brittle material. So, what theory and under what material, under what condition it should be applied? So, that, that is a very, very, very important theorem where the questions are repeatedly and most commonly will be asked. Because you look at any, any exam, any exam connected to the ISRO or a GATE or a DRDO, when you are preparing for the strength of materials, give the topmost priority to the what theories of failure. Because one shot, two birds, because all, uh, uh, even the design concepts also will get cleared. Okay. So, and, uh, uh, and uh, another imp uh, very oftenly asked questions for, from the FM I face is, mathematically divergent dot V is equal to 0 and curl V bar is equal, this is a divergent, this is a curl, this is a curl, this is a del V, del dot V, right. When you write, this is a vectorial notation of the fluid flow which is a vectorial notation of the certain fluid flows. When you should write this, when you should write this. This is the equation which is applicable for continuity equation for three-dimensional steady incompressible flow. Three-dimensional steady incompressible flow. This is the continuity equation. Conservation of mass. And when this is uh, written, this is written for the irrotationality of the flow. Irrotationality of fluid flow, this is the checking. Because when the irrotationality fluid flow means omega angular, uh, angular mean omega x uh, should be 0, omega rotation component among all the three, all three are rotation components, only when all the three rotation components are 0, then only the flow can be called as, the flow can be called as irrotational for which this is the condition, required condition. Curl V is equal to 0. So, that is for irrotational flow, curl V, for the continuity equation, it is a divergent V. In fact, or del V as such. So, this is the vectorial notation of the fluid flows which are very commonly asked in the kinematics because 
in the fluid mechanics the most commonly asked uh, uh, chapter is kinematics of the fluid flow then for which you should have the some mathematical backup like uh, what is the convective acceleration what is the local act generally the people do, i keep asking uh, people student uh, students keep asking me you are talking about two accelerations in the fm convective acceleration and local acceleration what is this uh, after all acceleration is the rate of change of velocity then why again it is a convective acceleration and local acceleration convective acceleration means the change in velocity from location to location at a given instant of time at a given instant of time if the velocity component along any direction maybe u or a v or a w is changing from one location to the another location at a given instant of time it will be the at the fluid will be having the convective acceleration local acceleration talks about at a particular location or at a particular spot in the fluid flow if the velocity component changes with respect to time then there will be a local acceleration in steady flow local acceleration will be zero in the because uh, again to understand this convective and local we should have the you should have the proper understanding of the classification of the fluid flows what do you mean by steady what is unsteady what is uniform what is non uniform Co that classifications if we don't know we cannot understand this uh, convective and local accelerations in the uniform flow in the uniform flow at every location you will have the same velocity same velocity component at every spot at every given instant of time automatically convective convective acceleration is zero supposing if, you are, if the flow is happening in a nozzle if the flow is happening in a nozzle does it have the convective acceleration or a local acceleration if the flow is happening under steady state conditions if the flow is happening under steady state conditions means the local acceleration automatically becomes zero but it will definitely will have the convective acceleration because you will have a different velocity here you have a different velocity here definitely there will be a convective acceleration so at any given instant of time these two velocities are different definitely there will be a convective acceleration then why the local acceleration is zero because the conditions are steady steady fluid flow he has mentioned in the problem the steady means no variation this steady word very frequently people asking me i keep asking me what is the meaning of the steady this word steady will come in thermodynamics fluid mechanics heat transfer and many more other uh, power plant etc what do you mean by steady steady means things must not change with respect to time at a particular spot at a particular location various flow characteristics various fluid uh, characteristics may be pressure or a temperature or a density or whatever it is they must not change with respect to the time if they are changing it becomes unsteady or transient that is what you see in the heat transfer also transient conduction heat transfer where the temperature keep changing with time there only the bolt number concept lumped heat analysis concept comes there only and actually in the lumped heat analysis or in the unsteady state heat transfer unsteady state conduction heat transfer two numbers will come actually very often we speak about bolt number but there is one more number called as the fourier number see in the in our mechanical engineering there are about one dozen one dozen dimensionless numbers will come heat transfer and uh, fluid mechanics put together put together more than a dozen uh, one dozen uh, uh, dimensionless numbers will come about like uh, weber number mac number reynolds number fourier number euler number bolt number stanton number reynolds number etc okay nusselt number, number prandtl number so uh, more than a dozen dimensionless numbers will come in any competitive examination any exam pertaining to our mechanical engineering all these numbers one should have a idea definition like mac number what is the significance of the mac number it is the velocity of the fluid divided by the velocity of the sound in the fluid generally people asking students when do you talk about this mac number when you bring about this mac number mac number is spoken about only in one context that is in the compressible fluid flow compressible fluid flow when the velocities of the flows are very very fast when the velocities of the fluid flow are very very high comparable to the velocity of the sound in the fluid then only this mac number or which is the ratio between the velocity of the fluid divided by the velocity of sound in the fluid is talked about so so the, the moment you talk about the fluid flow you should immediately talk about which is compressible which is incompressible 90 per 95 percent cases we deal with the flows as incompressible where the density is where the density is constant density is constant means incompressible so same continuity equation if you just look at this del dot rho v is equal to 0 this is this is for the general this is for the general that is dou by dou x of 
rho u plus dou by dou y of rho v plus dou by dou z of rho w is equal to 0. This is the, this is the, this is the uh, continuity equation. This is the continuity equation, three-dimensional for compressible and incompressible flows. Both for compressible, because rho is inside. If rho is constant, that is incompressible flow, compressible or incompressible, there is only one parameter. If rho is constant, simply rho can be taken out. That will become dou u by dou x plus dou v by dou y plus dou w by dou z is equal to 0. This is the del dot v is equal to du. This is the continuity equation for steady three-dimensional incompressible flows. Steady three-dimensional incompressible flows. Whereas this is the continuity equation for steady, for steady three-dimensional compressible or incompressible 3D flows. Either compressible or incompressible, that is a general equation. If rho is constant, it is incompressible. When the rho is constant, automatically the flow has to be incompressible and there is no significance of the Mach number. If rho becomes a function of pressure, then it is comes the compressible flow. Rho changes, you know, this is a compressible flow where definitely that Mach number will come into picture. Very important number, velocity of the sound divided by the acoustic velocity. So, the, the, as, the, as, you, as, the, as you get your doubt cleared by an expert in one particular area, the, you will be in that radar, in the radar of the doubts, most of the things, most of the concepts will be cleared. The only thing is, who is clearing your doubts? That is very important. Who is clearing your doubts? What expertise he has got in that subject? There our role comes. At our uh, academy, M Sigma Gokulam, we have the, a team of experts. I, I myself has got more than 25 years of experience in all these subjects entire thermal and uh, some parts of the uh, mechanics and uh, I would be able to clarify the doubts instantly insta instantly and uh, when covering a doubt when I, when I cover a doubt a lot of uh, other doubts will be automatically covered in one doubt I would uh, I would specify that most of the doubts pertaining to or uh, revolving around that doubt will get cleared because when you are getting one doubt in any particularly subject there that doubt will not be unique it has a link to some other domains of this subject. So, when you are getting the doubt cleared, all the other uh, nearby, nearby domains also must be cleared. With one doubt clarification would be enable you to get clarified many other doubts pertaining to that particular topic, that particular subject. So, that is where comes this Ask Expert uh, program. In this Ask Expert program, we, are, we have already have the WhatsApp group and also the Telegram group, where uh, many mechanical engineering students open it is open to all no restriction you can freely enter into that uh, particular group just by logging into that particular logging into that particular just a link just click that link you will automatically uh, you are uh, will be added into that group and you can post the questions as soon as possible at the earliest you would get your doubts clarified orally or with a with a voice message uh, and whatever may be the doubts generally some students are uh, feel think uh, they are introvert type so, is my doubt worth asking? Am I getting the doubt properly? Is my doubt uh, silly? Is it silly? Is it proper? Is it worth asking? They get, they themselves keep uh, doubtful about their own doubt. So, do not hesitate. Even if it is a silly doubt, just post it. Just post in that group and our experts will come there and try to answer that question at the earliest possible actually. Otherwise, Otherwise, you know, you will, if you, if you keep, uh, uh, if you keep nagging, if you keep uh, nagging about that doubt, you would not be able to proceed further in that preparation. That preparation for the, can be for any examination, need not be GATE, need not be IES, it can be for the semester examination, it can be for the service commission examinations or it can be a state government examination uh, you are preparing. Uh, so, whatever may be the examination, you are welcome to post the doubt uh, in that ask expert uh, group. In fact, in the description of the video, you will be given a link. Just click that link and automatically you will be joined into that group. And, uh, and, and in that particular group, uh, need not be doubts. It is, it is not only the doubts and uh, the career prospects are also can be exchanged. What, what, uh, what will be the examination you are going to write and what are the subjects uh, which are more important, which are more relevantly to be asked in that particular examination. Say for recently when ISRV exam was done. 
major most of the questions were pertaining to the design machine design actually uh, some people think that it is a fluid mechanics because it is an isr exam but they have asked most recently conducted isr exam i have released the one of my videos also solutions i had given for the isr exam which was conducted two months ago most of the questions were asked regarding the design okay in this year gate uh, most of the questions was asked, asked in the in the heat transfer as asked about more than nine marks in the heat transfer so the exams may be different but the fundamental questions the fundamental topics the fundamental doubts what you get while preparing for any competitive examinations will be the same will be the same let, let supposing if you are setting a paper on som no som paper will come out without with the without the question of uh, without the question of uh, principal stresses more circle see when you draw, see the most commonly asked doubt is how do you draw a do you do you draw a more circle for a fluid element at rest this is a fluid element at rest this is a fluid element at rest then how do you draw the more circle this is a fluid element under static condition how do you draw the more circle fluid element at rest is subjected to the is subjected to the same hydrostatic pressure on all sides p is same therefore p is same what is the what is the shape of the more circle it is simply a point a point on the negative axis normal this is a this is the shear there are no shear stresses only normal stresses and both are equal and they are compressive in nature obviously it is on the left side this is p this is a more circle this is a more circle more circle for that state of stress for the fluid element at rest so a fluid element rest at rest is subjected to the same hydrostatic pressure from all the sides according to the blaise pascal's law according to the pascal's law the pressure at a point is uniform along all the directions therefore uh, the radius of the more circle becomes zero when the radius of the more circle becomes zero the more circle shrinks to a point why are marked on the left hand side because it is of compressive nature acting on to the face okay so normal on the normal uh, axis only but on the negative side this is a shear there are no shear stresses a fluid element at rest is not subjected to any shear stresses no tangential stresses only normal stresses that too of, of compressive nature so this kind of the this kind of the inquisitiveness when you are when you are learning one doubt clarified you should get doubts many doubts you should get clarified with that idea uh, this ask expert uh, program is launched and it was launched long ago but it is already there now the, we want to spread out to many other uh, mechanical engineering community students there is a mechanical engineering students community uh, there you may post your doubts just by uh, clicking onto that link which that link will be given in the description of this video and in the description of this video will be given the two links one from the whatsapp one from the telegram any subject pertaining to the mechanical engineering you are free to ask see this is shekhar from m sigma gokulam so with this uh, i would uh, Uh, i would uh, i would like to uh, tell all the best for all to all the students welcome to our whatsapp groups or telegram groups to uh, ask the doubts welcome uh, that welcome the doubts we are welcoming the doubts from your side